you and your, your colleagues published a, a, yeah. a piece last year talking about mm -hmm. the fact that we're entering a new commodity super cycle. Um, could you talk me through or just introduce what are the pillars that mm -hmm. underpin that okay. thesis? Yeah, I, again, it's like, like world class, you know, super cycle is kind of easy to bandy around and, and we have to be very careful and, and kind of say, what, what, what is that? Because uh, it does have a lot of connotations and it's different for different people. Um, I guess if you just compare it to the last super cycle, if you like, was a China driven, uh, commodity driven, demand driven uh, structural cycle that lasted, from an equity point of view, it was quite noticeable for, for pretty much the 2000s. It peaked in 2008, but it was going even prior to the very late 90s. It became, it became very noticeable and important because China was so big and so influential in, in, um, in the global commodity markets because it sort of, through the 90s, it shifted from being self-sufficient in most things to being a significant importer. And as a result, that just was a major catalyst for investment, prices, etc. So if we kind of look at that template and we look at what, what's happening today, well, what's happening today is a similar kind of thesis, but it's not just China. And this is, this is different because this is not about industrialization and urbanization as so much. It, this will continue, of course, because other countries are going through that phase. But this is going to be driven by a different thematic and, and we've, it's that decarbonisation thematic. And what is that thematic? Well, as we've seen in the, in, over the last, certainly 10, 15 years, this kind of theme about climate change and all the other kind of dynamics are becoming kind of more and more important, you know, more and more discussion, debate, of course, it's not all resolved, but a lot more debate, a lot more awareness. And now we're starting to see governments and regions and in specific companies articulate their decarbonisation goals. What's decarbonisation? Basically, it's looking to reduce the carbon footprint that the world has, whether at the company level, whether at the country level and the product level. Um, the implications of that are quite significant. Um, and by quite significant, we mean it will be driven by uh, technology, processes, and materials. Because we will need materials to execute on this broad strategy. And what does that mean? Well, decarbonisation means reducing the footprint. By reducing the footprint, a couple of things that have to happen. One, the percentage of fossil fuel uh, generation will fall. It won't go to zero because it can't. Uh, that's why it's called net uh, carbon neutral. There'll still be carbon emissions from fossil fuels, but it'll be compensated by new things, clean technology, renewables, etc. Offsets. Um, to achieve that, we need to go through the transition in mobility. You know, and this will be you know, EV generated, electric vehicles, hybrids, or whatever it may be. And we're kind of at the cusp of that. This has been happening now for quite a few years, but it's all about scale. You know. It's, it growing at a fast rate and all of a sudden it just that rate is significant. A la what happened to say broad commodities when Chinese growth was 10% per annum GDP from a very small base and all of a sudden it's at a, such a base that that 10% is seriously impactful and we're kind of getting to that with EVs. We're seeing that with renewables but it's a start not the finish. And when you look at the sort of 2050 target, now some countries are talking about 2060, some maybe 2040, but let's say 2050, it's a multi-decade story and it, and it needs investment year in, year out. Now, EVs, renewable energy, all need materials. Now, whether that's um, battery raw materials for the lithium ion battery, uh, it won't be the only battery, there are other technologies, other chemistries that will be applied over time, uh, wind power, solar power, they all need raw materials and there are things like copper, nickel, uh, manganese, cobalt, you name it. So uh, what we're seeing is a structural driven, um, demand driven scenario um, that will last for quite a few years. Obviously there will be risks to that, you know, nothing goes up in a straight line. Uh, there will be economic uncertainty, there will be ups in economic cycles and down cycles, but the trend will generally probably be up. Now, uh, we're already starting to see evidence of that and, and commodity prices are rising, uh, inflationary expectations are starting to kind of mount, 
uh, from a low base. Um, commodity prices are now getting to a point where they're at levels to incentivise new development because we will new new, need new development. And that's the other positive from a commodity or, or resource investor point of view is that whilst commodity prices are rising, that's a good thing. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean equities can continue to rise. They'll rise if they create value and they'll create value through growth, developing new projects. And the world will need new projects because the industry um, from the last peak cycle to, to about 2015 went through a bear market. Uh, companies have stopped spending capital or reduced capital spend to generate free cash and improve balance sheets and those things. What we've seen is if you don't invest at a certain level, uh, the project pipeline depletes, uh, you run the risk that uh, production won't meet demand. And we're already starting to see inventories decline of various base metals. Um, um, iron ore, for example, is a great example. Whilst participating in a different way, uh, it's supply constrained and demand is very good. And in these sort of markets, price goes up and remains stronger for longer, which is what's, what's happened. So what we're saying about a super cycle, we think it's a multi-year demand structural driver. Uh, the industry's not set for that, right? The industry's been spending time spending less capital than it was, uh, repairing balance sheets and those things, and now it has to start reinvesting. But up until very recently, uh, at copper at $3 a pound was just not sufficient enough to justify developing a new big porphyry copper mine because you'll just get a very, very low return. And the market certainly wouldn't reward companies doing that. But at $3.80 or something like that, um, it's, the incentive is right. And interestingly, we're now starting to see you know, um, various in, um, investment banks, brokerage firms starting to talk about the super cycle, uh, the commodity super cycle, and increasing medium to longer term prices for some of their commodities. Just the other day, I uh, saw one brokerage firm, City, increase their copper price to over $5 a pound sometime in 2022, which is quite a significant uh, number. Uh, at that number, the industry is seriously profitable. So multi-year, demand-driven, supply needs to respond, um, and this will take a few years to happen. That's, that's the exciting part. That's what we classify as super cycle. Now, in an equity cycle, uh, things can go up and down, uh, and, and we've seen that in the past, but we think the general direction is going to be positive. Mm. Just quickly on... Um you know, I think the, the move towards decarbonisation, renewables, EVs, lots of interest, yeah. lots of talk, I think is kind of a, a broad acceptance. But in terms of just some of the policies and some of the stats mm. that really matter, could you just give me a talk about the things that you think are really important that, that kind of underpin that? Yeah, well, I guess if we look at uh, what's driving it, and I, and I probably need to add, you know, what's driving this is it will be demand, but it's partly regulated demand. That is the EU, uh, the US, who are committing to these uh, decarbonisation targets um, will ensure from a regulatory point of view that that happens, um, which means it has to happen, okay? That, that's the tendency. So even if there's an economic slump, there'll be support for it. And we've already seen significant investment uh, indications in the EU. I think they're talking about a, you know, nearly a trillion dollar a uh, trillion euro uh, stimulus, if you like, to get the ball rolling. Um, if you add private equity, it's, it's kind of been considered that up to 10 trillion euro will be spent between now and then just to facilitate this. We've heard from uh, you know, the US government that they're looking at their first phase sort of you know, renewable energy strategy of maybe a trillion US, if not more, just to get moving. We've seen governments provide fiscal stimulus just to keep economic activity proceeding, obviously impacted by COVID and things like that. So that's underpinning that. If you look at the impact, um, BHP had an interesting slide recently and we can talk about that in, uh, you know, we can send it to you, but it was quite interesting. You pretty much have to halve, you know, by, by probably 2030, the carbon emissions, just to kind of be on track to meet the net, um, net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So that's a big undertaking. Um, what does that mean? It pretty much means that EVs, which might only be maybe five million of them this year, uh, uh, in total in, in the globe today, will be over a billion by 2050. Fossil fuels goes from 80% to less than 50. Um, 
carbon capture, which is an interesting kind of concept and it's used a little bit, goes to thousands and thousands of facilities that will be capturing carbon in some form or another. So these are the sort of things that we see. What's the impact on commodities? Recently, um, UBS did an interesting research note on, on the outlook for battery raw materials. And what they're saying, for example, and again, it's all, we can argue with the assumptions, the, the issue is direction. So let's say by 2040, I think it is, that um, if you have EV penetration, say 40% of, of new vehicles are all EVs, we're a long way from that today, but given what's happening in the industry and the investments that are taking place, that's likely to happen. Let's say it did, then li the lithium industry, given its scale, has to grow by over 10 times. Uh, now, you can, that runs off the tongue very easily, but what are the implications of investing that much capital um, to deliver that much volume? Uh, now, it's going to be going to be rocky, of course, as we've seen in the last couple of years with lithium. There was a short-term oversupply relative to demand and things collapsed, but now they're recovering. So this has to happen in lithium. Uh, graphite, it's probably the same scale. Um, in base metals, um, you know, copper, again, probably you have to probably produce an additional three to four million tonnes of copper in a 25, 26 million tonne market. Now, it doesn't sound big, but it's huge. You know, because to build that much new capacity, it's a big challenge because there's not enough projects at the moment. The pipeline of projects is very shallow. Um, it'll be difficult for the industry to do that. It's not to say it won't, it just means that commodity prices need to be high enough to incentivise new exploration, new discovery and development. Uh, nickel, uh, nickel being used in, in lithium ion batteries, that market could double in scale from today over that period. Again, a significant undertaking. So they're the kind of uh, metrics that are, that are out there that people are now starting to think about and appreciate and, and, and have an appreciation of the kind of impact you know, decarbonisation could have. So it, it's quite significant, quite challenging, but quite exciting. One of the things our investors love hearing about is an incredible statistic. Mm -hmm. Is there an incredible statistic from your field that you could share with us and blow our, our investors' hair back with? Oh, geez, uh, that's a tough one. Um, look, I, I, I just said the incredible st statistic is you know, 10x on lithium from today. You know, 10x, that's a big number. So just to give you a sense, you know, the lithium market probably consumes around 300, uh, 350,000 tonnes of lithium carbonate equivalent today. That's how big the market is, small in the scheme of things. It's got to go to 10 times x by 2030. 2035. That's a serious undertaking. Um, all that capital is yet to be spent, right? Um, and it's going to have its own challenges. So to me, something like that is a, is, is a very interesting statistic, uh, just to think about. 